Okay, so here's the poll. Uh, about half people from uh, the East Coast in the US, a lot of others in the US, some from South and Central America, a few from Africa, Europe, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, all over. Very good. Well, welcome everybody. I'm Dave Waits and I'm with uh, Pia Sorensen. And this is our science and cooking lecture. And those of you in the United States, it's a little uh, different time. We usually have it on Monday evenings, but we're very honored and privileged to have somebody, a chef from Spain. And uh, Pia will introduce her in a few minutes. Uh, let me say that uh, this, these lecture series are sponsored by Gastronomy Solutions, 1933, Escada, Mersec, the Harvard Mersec, Samik, uh, Shimadzu, and Broad and Taylor. And the next slide, uh, Pia. Yeah, so I'm not going to introduce Marika. Um, I'll let uh, Pia do that at the end. Uh, so let's have the next slide, Pia. So uh, we always start these lectures with just a little bit of discussion of the kind of science that we do in class. And uh, the last few weeks, we've been focusing on texture and mouthful, a mouthfeel of foods. So not only is taste important, not only is smell important, not only is what you see important, but the way you bite something, the way it feels in your mouth is also very important in how, food, uh, how, how much you enjoy food. And across uh, the slide, you can see uh, various types of uh, foods that are solid. And so we've measured their elasticity. And obviously the one on the uh, left is rock candy is very, very tough, very hard. The one on the left is uh, jello. It's much softer, uh, very soft. Uh, and in between is steak. But there's a completely different kind of food which we sort of put aside and we're going to now discuss. And that's shown in the next series of images. Uh, Pia, if you could, there we go. These are liquids, these flow. So uh, the one in the middle is a, a creamy salad dressing uh, and it flows, it flows fairly slowly. The one on the right is gravy. The one on the uh, left is obviously something you drink but you can see that the straw stands up in it. So it flows, but it flows really slowly. So let's look at this idea of fluids, of viscosity of fluids. Let's have the next slide, Pia. Here are some more um, uh, examples of this. And this is really something that's very, very important in your mouthfeel. It's how thick the liquid is, how easily it flows. That's the viscosity. So obviously the drink, the uh, milkshake in the middle is very thick and creamy. Uh, the soup on the bottom is so thick that it supports the little crackers, but clearly it flows. And in both cases, the flow of the liquids are very uh, important in how it tastes to your mouth. Similarly, the gravy, you always thicken a sauce, or you don't always, but you can thicken a sauce. And it's a great uh, uh, mystery. And uh, we talk a lot about how, how one goes about thickening. Underneath is honey. Things flow as slowly as honey, but it wouldn't taste as good if it didn't flow so slowly. And on the right is the sour uh, is a salad dressing, but below that is uh, mac and cheese, and the sauce on that also flows. And without the sauce, without the very uh, uh, viscous sauce, the mac and cheese just won't take taste the same. So let's look a little bit more about what that means to flow, the thickness of a liquid, how it flows, and chefs also talk about being, things being thick. We talk about uh, the viscosity; it's the resistance to flow. So on the, on the left is water. That flows really easily. You can see that as you pour the water out, it just flows away very quickly. In the middle is honey. It flows, but it's much, much slower. But what about on the right? That's bread dough. Is that a liquid or is that a solid? Well, clearly, if you look at it and you hold it in place, it's a solid. It stays still. It's absolutely a solid. But a good bread dough, if you come back, an hour or two later, it will, it will have flowed some, it will have spread some. So it flows, but very, very slowly. So this is a very important feature of viscosity. You can't think just of what it behaves at an instant in time, but how it behaves as a function of time. 
how rapidly, how slowly it flows. Time is intrinsically related to the sense of viscosity. The next slide, uh, Pia, uh, shows some examples of the kinds of things that the kinds of ways that you can change viscosity. So the first one is a reduction. And there, you just boil it more and more and more, and it gets thicker and thicker. But you have to boil it really a lot. Um, on the uh, right, you can make something thicker by adding starch. That's a way of often making sauces thicker, making gravies thicker. But there are other ways of doing it. The next one is an emulsion. And there, you take a, a liquid inside a liquid. Liquid drops inside a liquid. Think of mayonnaise. That's oil drops inside of some uh, water-like fluid, but you mix them really, really hard and you put lots and lots and lots of drops in. And again, it looks like a solid, but that will flow. And finally, the last one is a way of uh, thickening many, many things. And you'll see this all over the place. Uh, you add a little bit of polymer, maybe one or 2%, and you change something from that flows very, uh, very easily. It's a very low viscosity fluid into something that's a very viscous, a high viscosity fluid. And that looks like a yummy milkshake. And I think Pia, now you're going to explain a little bit about what causes the viscosity. Yes, that's right. So, so you just told us a little bit about what these things look like on a macroscopic scale, what they look like if we look at things with our naked eye. And usually when we want to understand things scientifically and when we want to try to sort of figure them out, it's helpful to think about what they look like on a microscopic scale, what they look like on a molecular scale. And um, Dave told us that, that the sort of what characterizes a fluid is that it can flow. And on a, on a um, microscopic scale, that would look something like this. There are these yellow particles and they're suspended in, in this, this liquid, and as they flow, they, they flow over each other, they move over each other. So as a chef, and if you, if you wanted to manipulate how um, thick or thin a liquid is, how viscous it is, if you're Marika and you want to make the perfect um, crema or, or, or gel or something else, um, this is basically what you have to work with. This is what you have to manipulate to change the viscosity. And there are essentially two ways that you can do this. And the first one is related to something that I think you're all familiar with, even though it may have been a while. Um, and that is the fact that you could slow this flow with having more or larger particles. So, so the analogy to think of here is you're on a train platform, there's almost no one around, and you can then very quickly sort of run across the platform or walk across the platform because there are no other human particles um, in your way that impede your flow. On a very busy day in non-COVID times, maybe there are lots of people there. There are more human particles and that impedes your, your, your flow overall. And so you all move more slowly. You're more viscous, the, the material is more viscous. You could also imagine that maybe everyone on the train platform is carrying large suitcases or rolling around big strollers. And so they're even bigger and they're taking up even more space. And this is also going to slow down the flow overall of, of how, how quickly um, people can move across the platform. So this idea um, is basically summarized in something that we call the volume fraction. And the volume fraction captures this idea that the more volume of particles there is, whether it's because there are more of them or because they're just bigger, the, the more viscous the liquid is going to be. And so you can characterize this in this equation. So this little um, uh, phi here, this little, little symbol is the symbol for volume fraction. And it tells you that you have a certain number of particles and each particle has a certain volume. So if you multiply those together, you get the total volume of all of the particles. And then if you divide that by the volume of the fluid, 
So the total space that you have to roam around in. So this would be on top here would be the equivalent of all the people on the platform. And on the bottom would be the, 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 the space of the platform. If you divide these, then you get what's called the volume fraction. And the higher the volume fraction, the more viscous the liquid is going to be. And the lower it is, the less viscous it's going to be. So this, my friends, is our equation of the week. And if you've been with us for a while, you know that in this class, we clap for equations. So I encourage you all to uh, have a clap for this beautiful equation um, in your home. And just imagine the roaring applause for this equation if we were all in the same place. OK. The second way is to somehow stop these particles from flowing by some other means. And so if, if you were all here in front of me, I would ask you, what are your ideas? How else could we make, how else could we sort of impede this, this flowing of particles? And maybe there are lots of you out there, but maybe some of you would say, what if we could kind of trap them? What if we could hold them back from flowing? And this you could do if you added polymers. So here I've kind of put in some, some, you can see how these polymers are spread out throughout the liquid. Polymers are these long strings um, of, of monomers. So they're, can, they can be carbohydrates or proteins. Um, they spread out in the liquid and they kind of slow the flow by trapping the particles. So this movement that I'm showing you here you can imagine that, that these yellow particles would kind of be stopped by this, by this net, by this gel that's holding them back. And so you will see, oh, oh, I should explain to you why this is so effective. This is so effective because it traps the particles, but it's also effective because these long polymers, they flow over each other extremely slowly. So even if you add just tiny amounts, of a polymer, you will notice that the viscosity increases hugely. So you'll see this when Chef Marike adds some of these things to her, to her dishes, that she's often adding very small amounts, but she still gets a really big increase in viscosity. And the reason this works is you can kind of visualize it by this image that if you were to have, if you have this entanglement of polymers, and you wanted to just have one move through that entanglement, it would kind of look like this, where it would have to kind of free itself from all the other polymers. And only once it's done that, it can slowly kind of wiggle its way out of the polymers. Okay, everyone, so two reasons. You can increase the volume fraction, you can add polymers, and basically that explains all of the foods that, that Dave mentioned. And as I move into um, Marika's lecture, I challenge you to watch as she's manipulating her ingredients and think about which of these techniques she's using. Obviously, in reductions, you're boiling off liquids, so you're increasing the volume fraction of stuff. Um, when you make an emulsion, you're making little bubbles of oil and water. This increases the, the volume fraction and increases the viscosity. For starch, the starch granules are swelling. We've seen that in the previous lectures. And for various polymers, um, such as pectin or agar, you're increasing the viscosity by trapping and slowing the, slowing the flow that way. OK. If you'll allow me, I just want to say a quick few words about our book, because it just um, six days ago, became available in uh, stores in the US and in the UK. It will be available in stores in Australia and, um, sorry, in, in the UK and Australia a month from now, and in Canada and the, and, and the US, it is available now. Um, I think Patricia just put links to, to the book in these various places in the chat. Um, and in other places, it will hopefully be available eventually. You may just have to wait a little bit longer. Um, the Harvard Coop 
uh, who we have collaborated with for many years, have a special exclusive offer where if you order from them through this link, this blue link here, um, the link is also in the chat, you can get a signed copy um, that, that, that um, you, can, you can enjoy. Okay, so I think that's it for the book. And with that, it's time for me to introduce our speaker. So Marike van Burden is a pastry chef and a master chocolatier. And what this means is she has um, won the Dutch Chocolate Master Championship, and she has been a runner-up in the World Chocolate Master Championship. And um, I think what you'll see, and I, I love this because when I had conversations with Marika over the last few weeks, she really thinks about how she can use various ways to change the viscosity of things in ways that does not compromise flavor. And so I think, I hope that the, the ideas we've told you about will sort of help you think about what goes on as she shows you these various things. So with this, join me in welcoming our visiting speaker, Marike van Burden. Hello, I did lose the sound, so I think it's my turn right now, if I'm right. It is your turn. Oh, perfect. <laughs> because I wasn't 100% sure. So welcome, everybody. Welcome to Barcelona. Um, you're here in my studio where I do my R&D. Um, I used to travel a lot. I'm working as an international consultant. And so now I'm, like everybody, confined at home. But luckily, I do have this space, people working all different kinds of projects. And lately, I have been incorporating science way more into pastry because I've been excellent chance of working with Bella Castell. And I'm honored to be here today. I'm honored to have this talk for Harvard and for you all. So thank you for joining in. Um, let me see, I'm just going so I can get all right. So today we're going to talk about viscosity in pastry and chocolate. Now, I already explained way better than I can explain what is viscosity exactly. So we're just going to go very fast through that part. And I really want to take you to the recipes, to the type of work I do, and to really see those changes where Pia just has been talking about. There we go. So vis viscosity, as said before, it's the state um, of being thick, sticky, semi-fluid of, 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 in my case, the ingredients, the ingredients we're using or the elaborations we are making. Um, therefore, it is like we have different types of viscosity, as explained before. Um, so water being, for example, number one, a chocolate can be from 4 to 90. So each of the ingredients have their, their own viscosity. Um, so to, to go to what is the viscosity of chocolate. Now we all know there's all different kinds of chocolate and all the chocolates have different fluidity, we would say in, in, in the kitchen. We, the word viscosity, we, we use it less. We would say the fluidity of the chocolate. And obviously a milk chocolate, a white chocolate, a dark chocolate don't have the same fluidity. But even a dark chocolate that has the same percentage of cacao mass into the chocolate doesn't always have the same fluidity because there's several factors sour chocolate fluid so it's not only the recipe but well it's a lot to do with the recipe so not only the cocoa mass for example that is in our chocolate but has a lot to do especially with the fat content it's the cocoa butter we can melt which melts and therefore we get a more flu we have more fluid with more cocoa butter we have more fluid chocolate also some chocolates have emulsifiers the emulsifiers are added in order to get a more fluid um, chocolate. So chocolates without emulsifiers will be a thicker type of chocolate. Conching time. Once we, when we produce the chocolates, there is different ways of producing them. So when chocolates are longer or shorter in the, in the concha, of course, it influences the fluidity of the chocolates. The temperature, which temperature have I melt, melted my chocolate? And equally, are we already tempering it, the degree of tempering? Think about the tempering machine that has been turning all day 
And so we are basically over tempering our chocolate. At some point it becomes thick. Even the same chocolate by a longer time of in the tempering machine becomes thicker. It changes the fluidity, the viscosity of the chocolate. And so we can also talk about the fluidity or viscosity in ganaches. Ganaches, there's a lot of different types of ganaches. So think about a ganache that we want to make a cut bonbon. So a bonbon we, we cut and we dip it into the chocolate needs to have a different viscosity than a chocolate we then experience, sorry, a ganache we put in a chocolate bonbon. Chocolate bonbon needs to be more liquid. We need to be able to pipe it without getting any air bubbles in there. But therefore also the texture once we eat these bonbons is very, very different. Think about the bonbon with like a soft ganache that we can crack the shell of the bonbon that kindly like fluid comes out or a bonbon that is dipped automatically needs to be harder in order to be able to dip it in order for it to go over the belt. So we can also like the viscosity, we do taste that in the end, in the end product. And if we go into pastry, into pastry there's so, so many products we can talk about and unfortunately we won't be able to show all of them today, but Think about mousses. We have fruit mousses, we have chocolate mousses, but go into the vegan mousses or lactose-free mousses. Even with a fruit mousse, we can have very different viscosity. But equally, it depends on where am I going to use my mousse for? Is it for a glass that can be softer? Is it for um, a sliced cake that needs to stand in a thin line on its own? Or mold it that we glaze, where the glazing also holds the mousse. Then creams, very easy to see the fluidity of different creams. Think about a creme brulee, creme citron, and we will get back to that in a bit, and different chocolate cremers. Equally, with, depending on the chocolate we work with, depending on the ingredients we're adding, we change the fluidity, or we have different fluidities and different viscosities, different mouthfeel, different textures in the end. Glazings, chocolate glazings. Think about glazings that contain gelatin. Gelatin, it's that slower, um, compared to, for example, fruit glazings, I use pectin. Pectin has a different um, way of working, a different way of setting, and you don't have, for example, as much time as pouring it over your cake and spread it out. Nut glazings, same thing, depends on which kind of stabilizers am I going to use. Then we get to cakes and sponges, butter cakes, fruit sponges, chocolate cake, brownies, all different fluidities of our batter. The difference of the fluids in the batter we will also see at the end of the baking. Here as well, like for example, do I have a stronger kind of dough, like with uh, heavier ingredients in there, it will be a more moist kind of baking. Think about a Victoria sponge or think about a brownie. Very different kind of textures once we have the batter, equally very different once they bake and the experience we have while we're eating them. And here we come back to the ganaches. We also have chocolate whipped ganaches. Here we use even more liquids in there, in general cream, because we want to whip them up. So it's a different type of ingredient, or sorry, different type of texture from the beginning, but also a different way of working afterwards. Now in a chocolate ganache, for example, for a truffle, I will use a one-on-one, -on -one for one cream, one chocolate. But here I need to use double, or you can even go to triple the amount, depending on the chocolate flavor you want to get. And then we're going to whip them up after they are crystallizing. Bonbons, we can also use fruit jellies. We can use, as we said before, ganaches and caramels. Even caramels, we have in a lot of different fluidities, a lot of different viscosities, depending on how much liquid we add into our sugar, the type of sugars we're using. And that, once again, gives the difference in the mouthfeel, in the the experience of the, well, the eating experience and the experience of all the different textures. There we go. So now we go to something that I have close by heart, um, plated desserts. I've been working for 15 years before starting consulting in Michelin star restaurants. And one of the things I still love to do is plated desserts. Why? Because with plated desserts, you can give all, you can send out all your creativity. You can work with all these different textures um, and you don't have that issue of issue. Like you don't have that, when you sell a cake, it needs to go and travel to the person's house. It needs to stay in the fridge for another day or two. So you're very limited with 
kind of textures you can work with. Now in plated desserts, we plate them, we send them out, and the guest gets them to enjoy them straight away. So we can work here with way more different types of textures, different types of recipes, in order to make, in my uh, opinion, even a more experienced kind of mound feel by a combination of all these textures. So I'm just going to walk you through a little bit here, um, through all different kinds of uh, elaborations, type of creations I've been making over the past years, in order to explain a little bit the, the way I think, the way I create. So for me, textures, flavor, and design, all three of them are key elements for me when designing a plate dessert. Now, flavor in the end is the most important. The most important thing for me is when you serve a dessert, when you serve a cake, the customer, your guests get this, this wow feeling. You need to have that wow feeling when you see it because in the end, the eye eats first. But there's nothing more disappointing when I see something extremely pretty and then I taste it and the flavor is not up to the level of the way it looks. I'd rather have something looking slightly less well, but then when I taste it, I get this experience, I get this, you know, this, wow, wasn't expecting this. The opposite way is always a little disappointing. So that's something to really, really keep in mind. So on the first dessert here on the, on the left, this is a vegan dessert that I created recently, and it's all around um, figs and raspberries. And we work here with a vinegar, wine vinegar, to really balance out those flavors. So we can actually see here, this crispy meringue is the same Thank you. <laughs> um, one is dried out in the dehydrator and the other one, we whip them in the beginning of the service and then you pipe them on top of the plate at the moment. Over here, we can see, see a fruit wheel. This is only, sorry, to come back to the, to the meringue, here I used as a protein to whip up my fruit purees, I used soy protein. As we are here on a vegan dessert, we need to replace our animal proteins for plant-based proteins. Here we've got a twill of raspberry and figs. Raspberry and figs, I've combined it a little bit with puree with modified starch to spread it out really thin and then dry it out in the dehydrator. We have in here, we have the mousse, a mousse of raspberries and figs with the marmalade. So I will always have a marmalade as well in my, in my mousses, just to get that surprise once you're eating. So it's not always solid, just a solid mousse with a fruit glazing. So these are in, over here are the fruit glazings I was talking about. Except the green apple, you need to use a little bit of coloring just because green apple uses, loses color during the cooking process within these Glazings and this dessert, I haven't used any colorings. I fully work on the natural colorings. I work on freeze-dried powders in order to really get that um, fruity look, fruity feeling without any and adding any um, artificials. Over here, you see a little fruit gel and we will come back to that in a little bit. For, our, for my green apple dessert, this is a green apple dessert with arugula salad. So green apple and arugula go very, very well. And I paired it here with a vanilla. I needed something a little bit more rich because both of them are really fresh, a bit punchy with the spiciness of the arugula salad. And here we also have a foam, this time egg white powder. We have a ravioli of um, green apple marmalade. So inside there is like a fluid marmalade and then dipped it in gelatine vegetale. Gelatine vegetale will give me this really thin coating of like a ravioli type of coating. And then once you put it in your mouth, it pops. So you have all these different texture experiences. The sorbet and the sauce is purely green apple and arugula to really give that freshness that I want to give with a combination of the vanilla mousse that's over here. And on the top, we have a green apple twill. Now we were talking about ganaches. Over here in this dessert, dessert called Milky Nuts, so dessert all around hazelnut, milk chocolate, and yuzu. Yuzu here really balances out the flavors because both are a little bit rich, like the chocolate and um, the hazelnut. So I want something fresh. I want something to give a punch. So here, this is a whipped ganache of milk chocolate with just a little bit of yuzu as the acidity of the yuzu is setting as well, partly my, um, my cream of that acidity, the pH with the cream it really starts to set my cream. So I cannot put too much because it would split. 
Over here, the little dots, th those are the jellies of yuzu that I would also use into chocolate bonbons. And then this layer is a really thin layer of chocolate. And in the middle, we have here a creme of chocolate, a milk chocolate yogurt and hazelnut. So we go to the next slide. There we go. This, oh, that one took us. No, I'm not sure how to go back. Uh, one more, please. Yeah, perfect. So this, no. <laughs> yeah, or, no. Uh, if we can go back one slide. Yes, perfect, thank you. So this dessert here on the left is actually my dessert of um, Chocolate Masters, which was designed all around uh, honey, bees, loads of different textures in there with beer. The canal here, it's a little bit light, the picture, but the canal here was served as a warm, um was shaped in in a canal so in order to be able to have a shaped canal and heat it up again in the oven i used methyl methyl will help me to bind it without giving it any flavor and by heating it up it like a lot of the texturizers if we start to heat them up they will lose their power with methyl it already is set from 60 degrees onward so i could heat it up plate it quickly and then send it off over here, this is a very refreshing dessert, summery dessert all around uh, rhubarb and cucumber. So in this case, my dessert was more plated on the side and I served it with a juice of rhubarb and strawberry. So to also play with all the different textures we can have in a dessert, liquid, cold, foamy, crispy, and in that way I build in general of my desserts. And if it's around fruits, there will always be the fruits in there too either as a marmalade or as fresh fruit, depending on the seasons. Over here, there's a text all around different textures of raspberry, yogurt, um, and pomegranate. And here again, you can see that gel that we will come back to in a little bit. Those are fruit gels I use a lot. It gives a lot of punch, and it's, it's only fruits and modified starch. Here we go to um, and slide of cakes that are all lactose free. Lactose free, the whole, everything that is cream, butter, uh, milk has all been replaced. And here we need to start to play with inulina. We need to start to play with um, egg white powder in order to replace, um, replace these ingredients. Now, none of these desserts have any coloring. This is pure colors from the fruits. I really integrate a lot of fruits into my recipes in order to get natural color and natural flavor. This is um, a set of vegan desserts. Now, vegan desserts is still something I am working on and I want to get more and more recipes. It's, it's absolutely complex to be able to replace your animal-based products for vegan plant-based product, plant-based ingredients we need to understand a lot what is happening in our normal pastries. Like, to be honest, as a pastry chef, we, we do things, we make recipes, we have learned a certain way, and we do it because we, it goes that way. And from there, you, you try your new recipes. But once you want to change your recipes into lactose-free, fat-free, or reduced fat, uh, healthier recipes, you really need to learn what is happening in my normal recipes, what is happening in my non- uh, vegan recipes to understand how can I replace it because I cannot just replace an egg 101 I like for something else like there's no one simple solution to replace an egg there's no one simple solution to replace um, gelatin for example so all of these things you need to learn what are my ingredients doing in my recipes what is my egg doing into my recipe to understand how can I replace them and I will walk you quickly through the last recipes because I would really love to get more into the kitchen than just showing you pictures of what I'm doing. Here as well, we are on, on here, we are on the green apple and matcha tea vegan tartlet. Um, the one here in the bottom is vegan and gluten-free. So in this case, for to replace the, the normal flour, I started to work with buckwheat, buckwheat flour. And over here, we've got a guava vegan, um, Shot with sugar glass as well. It's more like takeaway kind of cakes. 
Then we go to a session and all the same similar type of colors. None of these desserts have used any coloring. I really, really worked on the fruits. I really worked on like getting all the flavor in there, natural color, natural flavor without adding any um, coloring. So we have a apricot that is with ginger, ginger, lemon and honey, um, melon dessert and a mango cheesecake. But a mango cheesecake, I wanted to reduce sugar, I wanted to reduce uh, fat. So it's a mango passion fruit cheesecake. But instead of using cream, che cream cheese and, um, and cream, I used puree and ricotta cheese. So ricotta cheese, it has less fat already. So I didn't add any extra fat from the, from the cream, but here I use mango puree, passion fruit puree, and I didn't use any sugar, extra sugar. So we have the fruit sugars. Most of the purees um, I'm using already have 10% sugar in there. So I didn't need to add any extra sugar. And so in this way, we get a cheesecake that is still very creamy, but also has a lot of flavors, but we reduce the amount of sugars. We reduce the amount of fat and actually it's gluten-free as well. So the crumble made gluten-free in order to make a gluten-free cheesecake. So the cheese, the, the base of the cheesecake, I do not cook it in the oven. I actually cook it in a thermal mixer and then I mix it with whipped cream, a little bit of whipped cream, a lot of cream cheese base and a little bit of gelatine and then bite it into the molds. So then we go to Banoffee pie, restyled. So here it is not sugar reduced, obviously. We are on caramel, banana, but full of flavors and just Restyle different desserts like traditional desserts for newer, newer style dessert. Over here, I've got a cookie which is sugar reduced. The chocolate is reduced um, sugar chocolate. And also, we lower the amount of sugar in the cookies. So it's like a gourmet cookie with a nice layer of chocolate on the top and some um, hazelnuts. And here is one of my big favorites it's a hiking bar. Um, love to go into the mountain. So this one, it's just loads of grains mixed with some uh, with some honey and then baked in the oven and then dipped in a dark chocolate. So perfect for traveling and just a really nice, nice snack. Now, this one is especially, these bonbons are my chocolate master bonbons as well. Here, these layers where I would like to talk about, and that's the first recipe I will show you um, in a little bit. So. Here we have a apricot gel. A apricot gel, like usually when I want to make like marmalades in layers or fruit gels or fruit parts in layers, often I use the whole fruit. But not always I can get my hands on, depending on which country I travel, I can get my hands on on the full fruit. And I was challenged to make a cake with apricot, but I only had puree. So now it's like, okay, how can I get enough flavor into my recipe and I really wanted to get the fruity layer into my cake with just having or just with having puree. How can I change the texture of my puree? Because purees, of course, fruits already contain a lot of water naturally. Once they are processed in a puree, the cells have been crushed. So we have more free water that came out from the fruits. And therefore, we need to change the texture of the puree in order to be able to incorporate it into our cakes. So we need to combine, we need to bind that free water. Now, one product that is very handy to do that, it's agar. Agar, coming from Aux, it's, it's a, it has a very high binding um, quality. Yet for me, the texture is quite hard. So the texture, the way the mound feel is, it's a little bit grainy. Um, it's quite a hard kind of, of setting. It's not very suitable for freezing either. So when we, once we do these layered cakes, we need to be able to, to freeze them in order to slice them nicely together. So, and equally for production purposes, often we make bigger batches and then we freeze them. So now I have this challenge, okay, I've got agar. Um, gelatin here would not be the good solution because this was for Indonesia. Indonesia, hot year round. People need to be able to take the cakes home as well without the layers sliding away, or it needs to be able to stand on a buffet um, without, you know, like the cake going left or right. So the best solution still was agar. But now I'm like, okay, now I can combine agar with something else maybe. So I combined agar with pectin. So pectin, it's a softer setting. Um, so in this way, 
the PEC team balances out the harder setting of the agar. So by combining these two, I kind of create a new kind of setting by using agar and PEC team straight away as they fully on the plant-based side, instead of using, for example, agar and gelatin. PEC team, it's very suitable to freeze as well. So I just tried it. And I got to this recipe that I now use in a lot of different cakes because it gives me this perfect layer, a very nice texture, a lot, lot of flavor into my cakes by combining agar and pecti. And that's where we are right now. So as you heard me talk already about the viscosity, the fluidity of fruit purees, it all depends on the natural fruit. So for example, we have strawberry, it's more liquid. For example, then I have a puree of pear because it bends also of the fibers that are in my fruit. So each fruit has their own content of water, fibers, of course, natural pectins. Once you make, once they produce fruit purees, the fruits are crushed. So all the water cells that were there, they are broken. So the free water is, the water, it, it, it is there free. Now, once we want to make recipes and we want to incorporate a lot of flavor, a lot of fruit flavor, we need to combine that free water. If not, what will happen after freezing? Water will come out or water will come out in the, in the cakes while they, in your, in your show window, in cake shops, for example. And this we can do with a lot of different kinds of, of ingredients. So I just named a few here. So we have loads of different types of pectins, all depending what we are going to make which pectin we need to choose. Do I make a marmalade or do I need to make a fruit jelly that I want to cut? I will need to use a different pectin. Agar, we just spoke about it. Then we've got santan, for example, for sauces, but it's very elastic. Um, not always the ones you want to choose, depends on what kind of texture you're looking for. Modified starches, egg white powders. So I will show a couple here for you to understand how can we change this fluidity of my fruit purees by incorporating different types of texturizers. And in this way, by changing the texture of my fruit purees, I can incorporate more fruits, which means more flavor. So for example, if I make a fruit mousse, think about strawberry. Strawberry, it contains a lot of water, the flavor is there, but it's not the strongest flavor. So if I, if I would make it with an Italian meringue, all my water from my Italian meringue, I replace by fruit puree. Then to make the meringue, I replace it not by egg whites, I do egg whites and egg white powder, sorry, puree and egg white powder in order to really incorporate the fruit. My puree, I will already pre-combine it either with gel creme, sorry, the modified starch, or I will, so, add an extra gel. So I've got my puree in which I incorporate some gelatin. Then I add my fruit gel, which is stickier, gives me also texture, but in that way I can add a lot of flavor. And these fruit gels, we can also, for example, add them in chocolate mousses. Do I want to make a black forest cake? For example, black forest cake, traditionally chocolate, vanilla, cherry. So now what, what can I do? Instead of just making a dark chocolate mousse, I can make a dark chocolate cherry mousse. I replace my milk for my ganache or my cream for my ganache by cherry puree. And I add a little bit of cherry gel into my, into my chocolate mousse. So in this way, I can add fruit flavor into my chocolate mousses. And this works for milk chocolate mousses, white chocolate mousses. So in that way, we can incorporate fruit flavors into the chocolate because in general, fruit and chocolate, fruit, chocolate and water don't like each other. But in this way, there is no issue of that, um, of that blocking of your chocolate by adding in the puree. So now let's go to, to the fruit sponge recipe. I'm just going to move my computer over there. Right. So as mentioned before, with the Italian meringue, I can replace my egg whites for egg white powder and puree. And this is what we're going to do in the, in the fruit sponge as well. Now I've got my fruit puree 
and I've got my egg white powder. With these two ingredients, in this case as well, we're going to add a little bit of sugar, but with these two ingredients, we can make a fruit meringue. So a fruit meringue, how does it work? My egg white powder, all the water has been taken out of the, of the egg whites, the original egg whites, and now I'm going to replace the original water from the egg whites with fruit puree. And in that way, we can whip up our fruit puree. So usually I would do this in uh, quite a low speed in order to give the sugar that we're going to add the time to be fully incorporated by the fruit puree. Today I will do it a little bit faster because it's a little bit noisy and that will block me from explaining the rest. So now for the egg white powder, we can just add it. No need to blend it in. In the beginning, you will see a little bit of lumps of the egg white powder. And so I will, I will show you in the top camera. So if I, you see, once it starts to mix, you will have these little bit of lumps, but they will be incorporated during the whipping process. Sorry for the noise. We're going to add the sugar just little by little. So I hope you can still hear me while I'm talking with the machine going. So these kind of meringues we can do with a lot of different fruit purees. The only puree where it doesn't work with it is the puree that contain natural fat. So one of the first lessons we get in phase three, make your bowl very fat free. So once we start to add a puree of, for example, mango or puree of coconut, it won't give up as well because you have that natural fat into your fruits that will not uh, that will block the egg white powder from whipping up. All right, so I'm going to do this a little bit faster than usual because of the sun. Another puree that is really impossible to do to do this kind of meringues with would be yuzu. Yuzu is really acid and it breaks down the egg white powder. All right, so the oven is already heating up, so then I will wait a few minutes for this to whip up because I'm just going to put it on full speed and then we can talk properly again.
Alright. So as I was saying just before, but the noise may have overtaken uh, from it. So the purees that won't work to do this would be mango and coconut. It's the natural fat of the fruits that block the whipping process or break down your egg white powders. Same for yuzu. Yuzu is too acid, really starts to attack straight away your egg white powder. It can work with a part yuzu puree, for example, and a part water. So you balance out again that pH in order for it to whip up. So here we are on a um, the moringa. So you see a moringa of raspberry gray. So very natural color, texture. So we hear on um, the puree, the albumina, and the sugar. And now I'm going to combine it with my flour and baking powder. So the baking powder will give it a little bit of the leavening uh, textures we need to get. Recently, I've been turning these recipes as well in plant-based recipes, and it's almost the same recipe, but I have to change my protein. So I changed my protein here for soy protein. Sorry, I say that wrong, actually, because soy protein doesn't behave as well in the oven. I changed it for potato protein. Soy protein, I use it for um, mousses, for foams, and potato protein, I will use it for my baking. So you see the texture of my sponge, nice and fluffy, very natural color, which we will keep in the oven. Now the baking temperature will be important here. If I will bake it too high, I, I will lose the natural color. So I'm gonna, going to go over 160, maximum 170 degrees for baking. There we go, I'm just going to spread it out. So the degrees I was just saying, my 170 degrees will be in Celsius. So I am not so familiar, I'm sorry, for Fahrenheit, seeing that there were very many people joining in from the US. Um, so all my degrees that I will mention today will be in Celsius. There we go. So I'm just going to spread this out. I always use a silicon mat. The, if I would use paper, paper might pick up the humidity and it won't bake as straight anymore. And then especially for, for layered cakes, where I really want to have everything same height, really important to have them very nice and straight. So now you can still add extra fruits if you would want. So for example, what I do a lot with a raspberry sponge, I will take frozen raspberries. Once the raspberries are frozen, I can just crush them and the cells maintain like in full cells. So then I can add them onto the sponge, the water won't leak out, and I add extra flavor, extra color onto my preparation. Put this away. And now this can go straight into the oven. For about seven minutes. So we'll show it to you in a bit so you can see the color after baking as well. All right. So the picture I showed you before of the, for example, the black, uh, the blackberry cake, the lactose-free cake, and the fruit tarts, the sponges were both made in this style. So the recipe you have seen them in the spreadsheet. Um, don't hesitate to ask if you guys want to have the recipe again because that all went fairly fast. 
So I'm sure Patricia might be able to type them for you in the chat. So don't hesitate to ask them if it was too fast and you would like to have this recipe. Very good basic recipe that can help you for a lot of different flavors. So now I would like to go to that fruit jelly we were talking about. So fruit jelly texture made with agar and pectin. So it's freezable and by combining them it's reversible. So you can reheat it again if you make a batch a big. And we are back, right? Yes, sir. So I'm not sure where you lost me. Um, I think you may have seen me still putting it in the oven. Um, I was saying the recipe. Please do ask in the chat if you really want to see the recipe or want to have it typed in the chat. Um, we will move on now to the fruit jelly I was talking about. So here you will see. This is a half recipe of what I what was written down. So we have 250 grams of puree. So we have here combined, you will see the, the pectin and agar that I will need to combine my puree. So you can see really the difference in amounts. Now, especially with agar, it's extremely important. We go super detailed. So agar, it is has like like I mentioned before, it is really really hard setting. So it's important to really make it scale it detail. So I've got apricot puree. Which now I'm going to preheat till about 40 degrees. Why 40 degrees? Because pectin is best to get added at 40 degrees. So 40 degrees, it doesn't give me any lump and also has enough time to be fully activated during the cooking process. So pectin always needs to be um, pre-mixed with a little bit of sugar. Now the sugar here is minimum. I don't really want to add sugar into my recipe. I really want to stay close to my fruit flavor. So in order to stay very close to my, to my fruit flavor, I want to stay away from sugar. So now agar actually could have been added cold. But as I'm adding here both texturizers, I'm just going to add them both first with the sugar. And then I'm going to combine them with my fruit puree. So now we're going to add it slowly into our puree, always mixing. Here it's important to use a whisk. If I would have fruit pieces, I would have used the spatula in order to be able to incorporate it nicely. And then I will give it a good boil. Now, 15, it's already activated around 82 degrees. To make sure, especially the agar, to make sure that everything stabilizes as well, I rather always give it a boil. So in that way, if one side, especially with big quantities, if one side of the, of the pot was a bit colder than the other side, I ensure that my texture everywhere will be the same. So I don't have that surprise that somewhere in the middle, something wasn't fully set. And then when you slice your cake, it's still sliding away from each other. So it's combining your dry ingredients with your sugar and then into your puree and you give it a good boil. There we go. I'm going to spread it out in a silicon mat. This is especially for layered cakes. If I spread it out nicely on the right height, it's easy to just after combine it with my sponge layers and my mousse as you saw in the, in the picture before. So here we go. Now it's important to pour this one out fairly hot as agar will start to set faster than pectin. I want to make sure it's going to be nice and straight everywhere. You already see the 
texture. It's a little bit thicker than my puree was before. There we go. Make it, make it nice and straight. And then we place it in the freezer. Now, since we won't have time to wait for this, for it to be nicely frozen, show the demolding, and then wait for it to be frost, I already made one before, which I will show you, because it's important to know the difference in texture. So I'm going to leave this one here, just to show you the really difference in both of the texture. What has agar and Pexi now really done to my, to my fruit puree? And in an equally need to go for my sponge. go. So you see my fruit sponge, trying to play with the light so you really can see it. So you see the color, it really has maintained its color and has the perfect texture here. Um, sorry, oh, we need, ah, could we maybe go for the top camera? No, okay, there we go, perfect. So you can see like the texture is really nice and fluffy. So the color, you really maintain the color, especially on the bottom. Of course, on the top, you lose it a little bit, but on the bottom, you really keep that color. And if you could smell it, you really could smell raspberry. A nice and flexible sponge, very fruity, and adds a different type of element into your cake. It gives that those layers of color and the layers of fruit. So here is the texture of the puree that we just combined. So you see it starts to slowly set here. And now this one I made this morning has been frozen and already demolded before. Otherwise, when it's really um, out of the fridge for such a while, you won't be able to do that. But you can see the texture of this jelly. So it's quite a flexible jelly. I will try and hold it. See, but it's still, but yet it is quite soft, so it was breaking already. I will go a little bit up here, so I'll try to do the same. I will keep it on the mat, but you see, it is a flexible jelly, but yet once I cut it, for example, so now it's been out of the fridge already for a little bit, but so I can cut like a perfect layer and it really stays, it doesn't walk away. Um, but when I want to eat it, and I'll show it here as well, if I want to eat it, it's nice and smooth. So it's not like a hard jelly. So it is a texture that is very, um, and I don't find the right word right now in English, but it's very um, pleasant in the mouth. It's not like a jelly jelly. It gives a lot of fruit flavor, but thick enough, like um, solid enough to use in layered cakes, for example, as well. So this kind of recipes with pectin and agar, we can make with any of our fruits, uh, with any of our fruits to really get that fruity filling um, into our cakes or dessert. All right, and then I would love to come back to camera one, please. So we had this other recipe we were talking about before and a recipe I use a lot, a lot of in all of my preparations. So, so the recipe it is modified starch and fruit puree. Once again, we can do it with all different kinds of fruit purees. Now with the very acid fruit purees, um, you will have to incorporate some sugar then I rather make like fruit jellies, so I rather cook them. But here we are. So I really want to show you all those different textures. Here we are on the fruit puree. Fruit puree, defrosted, nothing added. 
So you see the texture, it's fairly liquid. Here we go into the recipe that I wrote down. So 30 grams of modified starch and 500 grams of my puree. I'm not going to show it right now because it's a lot of noise, a lot of um, mixing with the Thermomix. I won't be able to explain anything in the meantime. So I'd rather just show you the different textures. Here, I'm halfway through the mixing. So this would be 15 grams of modified starch on 500 grams. So you see the texture is changing. It starts to thicken in. This is only 15 grams of 500 grams of modified starch that helps me to combine or to preset the free water of my fruits. Now, when I go to the full recipe, I have 500 grams of puree with 30 grams of modified starch. I'm getting to this texture. I'm going to show this to you on a plate as well, and then I will explain what is it doing exactly, this modified starch. So, there we go. Perfect. So, I have my fruit puree. I want to put a spoon on my plate. Now with strawberry, it does hold, but you see, it does hold, but if I do this, it starts to run. Now I do the same with my recipe with half the modified starch. Already nothing happens anymore. That one is still running. I'm not sure if the camera. Oh, perfect. Now it's running again. Perfect. It was blocked on our screen, so I don't know if it was blocked for you as well. So you see the fruit puree. Once I hold my plate to the side, you see it with half the amount of modified starch for my strawberry. And then I go to the full amount of modified starch. Perfect. There we go. And so I put a bit more. So obviously it is, maybe we can go to camera two, please. The top camera. So you see the difference in the different textures. So here we really have like a solid puree. Yet we didn't have to cook it. We didn't have to add anything else than modified starch. Now, why would I choose modified starch? Because I can also make these type of textures with, for example, agar. I'm going to cook my puree with agar, let it set, and then blend it, and I get a similar texture. First of all, it's two, two times I need to, to work my purees. Often in, in the kitchen, we're always too busy. So that is one of the reasons. But the more important reason for me is I'm going to cook my purees. I'm going to change it from the fresh fruit that it is when it came to frozen into the puree, it hasn't been heated. Now I'm going to heat my puree. I'm going to lose natural color and natural flavor. So I'd rather really stay on a cold process than on a hot process. Now, how can I do this with starch? Like if I mix in normal starch with purees, nothing is going to happen. Now this is modified starch. Modified starch, what does it mean? The molecules of my starch are pre-opened. They have been pre-cooked. So they are in a state where they can incorporate any liquid cold. So I don't need to heat the starch. Starch can be from different products. Um, so it can be from tapioca and can be from potato, for example. So in this case, I just need to incorporate it into my fruit puree or it can be, can be a, in the savory kitchen, it can be a stock or it can be an infusion, it can be different type of ingredients. So I need to blend it together. What is now the most important? I need friction. So I make it in the thermomixer in general. I don't go lower than a recipe of 500 grams, the smallest um, we can do in a thermomixer. We could do it by hand blender as well if you don't have the thermomixer, if you want to make smaller recipes. But sometimes, depending on which product you're using, it might be a little bit hard to incorporate and we might keep these little lumps of the, of the modified starch. That happens, just pass it through a strainer to make sure you don't have these lumps because they're not very nice to as a mound feel. But these kind of uh, recipes, I use them in, so if I want to use it for fruit mousse, I go to a little bit lower amount, for example, of the modified starch. If I want to have it pipeable, then I'm going to put the 30 grams on half a kilo. 
I can put it directly in a piping bag with a nozzle and I can add very, very fruity flavors, a nice texture to eat, a lot of color, little dots in between my plate dessert or for example, on my chocolate tart or my fruit tart, just to add that little extra element. Another recipe I use it a lot for is I'm going to combine this with whipped cream. 70% of fruit gel or 60% of fruit gel up to your own taste and then add in um, strongly whipped whipped cream. So we get a fruit chantilly. Fruit chantilly that has a lot of natural flavor, very low on the lactic part, very high on the fruits. So natural flavor, natural color. Um, sometimes we want to add a little bit of gelatin mass in order to be able to pipe it into patachou, for example, or eclairs that need to be traveled. But it's a, with this and mixed with whipped cream, I already have two textures to go on the plate of dessert. So easy to make recipes by just changing the viscosity and the fluidity of my puree. I get already two elements, once I whip second element, once I whip it, mix it with whipped cream for my plate of desserts. Right. Just wondering, are there any questions so far? Because I have been talking an hour straight now. So there, there, there are some questions. If you could clarify again, you kind of touched upon it, modified starches. And what are the varieties of modified starch that you use? I, for this recipe, I use modified potato starch. Now, if you want to use modified uh, tapioca starch, it's even easier to incorporate than potato starch, but you're on a higher cost as well. So all depending, if you can afford to use um, modified starch from tapioca, I would choose tapioca. It's easier to incorporate. Um, don't need to blend it as much. You don't have as easy lumps as with potato. So... That would be my first choice. Now, if your food cost is a little bit more sensitive, I would go with modified potato starch. Okay, great. Uh, do you have time for another question? Of course I have. Okay, um, so, there's, so there's one question about, so let's say you didn't have egg white powder and you just <laughs> wanted to do it with, with egg whites. Would it just totally fail or what would you do? Well, the whole idea is in this case, in this recipe, is to really replace the egg whites with fruit purees. Now, with having traveled um, a lot, and I can't always get my hands on egg white powder as well, and I still want to get some fruit flavor into my sponges, what you could do is replace, in this recipe, you replace half of the fruit puree for the egg whites. So then the egg whites are strong enough to still whip up and get a meringue, so I do half and half, because if you want, for example, to make like a meringue that is a little bit more um, light, a little bit more brittle, you can make a meringue with half water, half egg white. So here in this case as well, we can do the same, half puree, half egg white. So I still have some flavor, I still have some color, not as strong as what I just showed you, but that would be a good solution if you can't get your hands on egg white powder. Um, and, and do you ever adjust for missing fat when you use the powder? Oh. Do you hear it? Did I, did I cut out? The, the question was if you ever adjust for missing fat to try to keep the creamy texture. I am afraid that we got no sound over here. So would you remind to repeat that question? I'm really sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Um, the question was, do you in any way ever adjust for fat to keep the creamy texture when you use the powder? Um, in this sponge, you mean? Yeah. Um, no, this, this sponge, I took out all the fat, actually. So I don't need to, to adjust it for, for fat. It won't work as well. If, I, if I'm going to add in, replace it by fats, it won't work. In what, one work in that sense, uh, what I want to do here is a, a fluffy meringue. So if it's in this meringue, I, I don't use a fat. So I'm not sure if that answered the question. No, I think it does. I think it does. Perfect. Thank okay, you. Um, there's, a, there's a question here about chocolate. What is the best chocolate to use for baking, in your opinion? It all depends what you want to bake. So. Do I want to make a cookie? Do I want to put it in croissants? Um, 
and there's no such of a one answer which is the best, best chocolate for baking to be honest it depends what are you going to bake which temperature are you going to bake there's way more factors um, that needs to be known in order to give an answer to that great I, I'm unsure, it, did you have something, uh, I, can, I couldn't tell if you were uh, taking a break and you were about to show us something else or if you felt that we can do Q&A you. from now on. No, 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 I would love to show you something else. Oh, okay, um, let's, right. let's go for so it. So I want to go to uh, the poll. So I was talking to Patricia just in the beginning um, that I have three recipes of of lemon cream here and i would love to know which people think would have the most flavor if it's the right one the middle one is this the right for you on the camera too right or not or is the opposite yes is the, the same this is okay the right one the middle one or the left one So, and I'm actually going to ask uh, Raul to taste them because I'm a little bit biased. So I want to get his opinion in order um, of which has the strongest flavor. And I would love to know if there is a answer on the poll. So there is, so, but, it, but it's a very mixed, it's very mixed. Uh, about half of the people say the right one would be the tastiest, about 25% say the middle and another 25% say the left. All right. So I will need to ask Raul, which one did you say has the most flavor? Well, I will have to be honest and say All right. All right. So I did not tell him this before that we were going to do this. I just put him on the spot. So if we go to, we see the little um, screen, the little recipe sheet there. So this is a more traditional type of recipe. So here we are, lemon juice, sugar, eggs, and butter. So quite a lot of butter, quite a lot of sugar. Now we go to a reduced fat and sugar um, version of the traditional creme citron. So here I need to work with different ingredients. As we are, um, we take out the eggs, we take out the butter, we need to get a certain stabilizer in there. So now on the, on the left side, we have the vegan recipe. And turns out what the answer of Raoul was is, and I did not tell him that before, therefore I'm very happy he gave this as an answer, He's saying that the vegan one has a way stronger flavor. Now, why is this? Why would the vegan one have more of a flavor than the traditional one? So if you look at the lemon juice, fairly the same in each of them. Yet, you see the amount of ingredients that we use below it. So once we want to make it traditional, there is way more sugar, way more butter, way more eggs. We, use, we lose the flavor of the lemon juice. Or, so we lose the really original flavor of the lemon. Sugar overtakes, butter overtakes tremendously the flavor of our fruits. So therefore, once we start to reduce the fat, we start to reduce the sugar on the second one, we already get a way stronger um, lemon flavor. Now, what we did to replace the part of the eggs and a part of the butter, here we start to work with pectin. We start to work with this ice cream stabilizing in order to stabilize my cream so I can still freeze it and I still get similar textures. So once we go to the vegan one here, I will need to take out even my eggs, even my butter. So how am I going to replace it now? I'm going to work with starch and I'm going to work with vegan butter. Vegan butter, I want to tell you something about that straight after this. Um, just want to show you the textures. So you see the texture of the traditional vegan, of 
traditional, sorry, lemon cream. So we've got these are all been out of the out of the fridge since the beginning. So we've got this smooth texture of lemon cream. Now the reduced fat, you see it's a little bit more slightly stickier, but for the rest, it really, really looks the same in terms of texture for from its traditional um, lemon cream. And now I go to my vegan lemon cream. It has slightly of a di different texture that is mainly to do as well with using the starch instead of eggs. But once I just mix it through, we get a very similar kind of texture to the ones before. It's a little bit less creamy, but equally I'm on way less butter here. But we have different textures, slightly different textures. But the most important is we really have the flavor of my fruit. I want to get the flavor of my fruit when I make a fruit cream. If I make a lemon cream, it should taste lemon. It should not taste just sugar, butter, and cream. So as we are a bit getting short in time, I'm not going to show you the recipe. Um, the recipe is there, but basically what we do with the vegan recipe is we do a very similar kind of way of cooking it. So I cook all of those in the thermomixer. Once again, I love to work with the machine because it helps me to do everything for me. I combine all my ingredients except the vegan butter together and cook it till, in this case, over 100 degrees. Here we are not on X, we are with starch, so I need to change my cooking temperature as well. We go to over 100 degrees, let it cool down once again to 35 degrees, like we would do for a traditional um, lemon cream or fruit cream, and then blend in the, the vegan butter at 35 degrees. We don't want to melt the butter, we want to keep that creamy texture of the butter into, into our preparation. So now I would um, quickly go back, like to go back to the slides, please. Just to explain you a project we're working on where we really combine science and pastry in this case. They are coming. Well, I will, while we're we'll waiting for the slides, I will just tell you about a little personal project we're working on together with uh, Pere Castel as well, who actually arrived here. So very lucky to have him here in the kitchen. Um, so we have been introduced. Um, oh, this is not allowed. We need to stay one and a half. <laughs> no, 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 the distance. <laughs> so now we have been in introduced last year. So. We have been working together on a very, very interesting project where we bring together science and pastry. So I started to, the whole idea came from making a vegan book. And therefore I really wanted to learn more about the ingredients, more about, you know, what is our, all, all our ingredients actually doing in our pastry. And therefore I get a lot of help from Pere, who actually makes me think differently. Who makes me think more like, his science side and combine it with pastry. In that way, I learned a lot more about ingredients. And therefore we started to, well, we started to work on vegan recipes and we figured out that vegan butter quite always has, or margarines, either palm oil, soy, um, nuts, and all of the different allergens, which, well, personally we didn't like. And we have been working on a new recipe to make our own vegan vegan butter. Now COVID started and the recipe wasn't finished at all yet. Now COVID, COVID arrived, COVID started, and then we need to think differently. Like I used to travel a lot, so I'm not working as much. So able to we hope that we can launch a new product which um which is a vegan butter which as natural as possible as little as added ingredients as possible so once and i used it today in the vegan lemon cream so once we're going to incorporate it into our recipes we want to not get any flavor not of different kind of oils we want to have a natural kind of butter that doesn't have any kind of allergens. So no gluten, no soy, um, no palm, none of the above, as natural as possible in order to make, to change 
recipes, not only, not only in vegan. So for example, I want to make a fruit cream like here, vegan or non-vegan. I don't want that taste of butter in this case. I need the texture of the butter. So therefore we, have, we are creating and we still are in process of, um, of sampling together with a factory um, because they are helping us now because what I can do here in my kitchen is very different again, what they can do. And here again comes the, the subject of um, viscosity because once I make it here, it was not as thick as when they make it. It needs to be able to work in machines too. So therefore when you produce products by hand, or if you produce products in a factory, it can very change, it can, the, the recipe can vary a lot. Once you produce it, for example, here I did it with a hand blender, super back and a thermomixer. It's very different than when it needs to go through all these lines and it needs to, and it gets cooled down way better than what I can do here with my blast freezer. Um, so recipes might to be adapted for which machinery you are using. Um, and I would love if we can share the slides, if it's possible to, Oh, they're there, perfect. So I didn't know they were there, sorry. So, oh. <laughs> you. You Thank you. so here you can see on the, um, on the left, the little picture, you can see it's the first, first of the samples of the vegan butter. To be honest, I actually just went on Google and I just found a recipe of what can I, what do I need to put in there? What can I make? And so I found a recipe that I tried and it was with nutrition and yeast. It was with all different kinds of ingredients. Um, it was horrible. So the first was like, this is not it. And little by little, you start to change. One thing I've learned very, very well from Pere, it's I was only allowed to change one ingredient at a time. I may not always have done it, but then afterwards he would ask me the question. So what did you change? And then it's like, oh, this and this and this. Yeah, but now we still don't know what's happening. So once you're creating, once you're trying to make your own formulas for ingredients, go one ingredient by one ingredient, write down everything. I work with spreadsheets, I put it in the computer, have the percentage calculated to understand what is happening. Because just seeing numbers, it doesn't always make sense. Once you see numbers in percentage, it makes may, way more sense what you're doing. So if we go to the, um, Sorry, the little picture on the right side is the samples we are getting from the factory. So now it's all getting real, um, and it's very excited to see. We only started this process in in April, and we have drawings already for some packagings. It's all I can share for you with you about that at the moment. But please stay tuned and on either our Instagram pages in order to, you know, to follow this process. Um, it's very exciting for me as a pastry chef to see that I can actually create an ingredient um, that will be going into market hopefully next year. So if we go to the next slide, you will see once I get all these samples in, um, I get a lot of different samples from the R&D, from the factory working with that are sending me all their ideas as well on how we can get this better. And then once I get these in, what I will do is I will do test bake. All of the, all of the, um, all of the different butters, vegan butters that I get, I will get, uh, I will do all the different recipes. So all of them, we taste them all next to each other. And so from tarts, shells, to cookies, to cakes, to really see what is working, what can be better. So it's a long process to also for me to see exactly what is happening in each of them. And we will only be happy when the end result is a one-on-one -on -one replacement. If not, it won't. So it's also about being extremely perfectionist about it to, in order to create the best product. Um, can I please go to the next slide? Yeah, perfect. So here, I just want to quickly show with you some other tests I'm doing at the moment. And once again, this is the whole science and cooking science and pastry coming together. I'm trying to create my own vegan whipped cream. This is still very, very much in the beginning of the process, but here as well, and I, I wish I could share a little bit more what I'm using, but at this point I cannot. But it is what I want to explain with this, 
is to inspire you. Like I did not think I could create a butler. If you would have asked me a year ago, or even in the beginning of the year, I would have laughed really hard. I did not think I would have the knowledge of being able to creating a product like that. But you just start somewhere. And from there, little by little, you learn. Of course, I have the luck of having the backup of Pere. Um, but you can find a lot in books. And I'm sure there's a lot in the new book of, of science and cooking as well. Um, so there's way more possible than you think yourself. So these are, uh, on the pictures, you can see some of my first tryouts for the whipped creams. And then on the next and almost last slide, um, we share with you a last recipe of um, a vegan chocolate cake. And there we go. And there you can see the spreadsheets I've created for myself. So in this way, you can see all the different ingredients. You see that my eggs here are replaced by proteins. I worked here with two different proteins uh, of peas and of potato, because sometimes I think the potato really overtakes the flavor, or you really can feel it a little bit in the end. So I prefer to combine two. Then to replace the eggs as well, we use the baking powder and baking soda. In this case, why two? Baking powder is a little bit more gentle, starts a little bit later. Baking soda starts faster, is bigger bubbles. Do I only use baking soda? Goes too fast, too big of a bubble. So by balancing out the two, I get a more even, um, even, profile, I guess is the best word, of my, of my air bubbles. Now the vinegar, why do I put vinegar? This activates my baking powders. So by if I want to make a dough that I don't want to bake straight away, don't put your acids, don't put lemon juice, or don't put vinegar juice yet. Because once we start to put the vinegar with our baking powder, baking soda, we do activate our, our leavenance, our baking powders. So in case you don't want to bake it straight away, wait a little bit with that. And here I used fruit puree as well in my cake, because often we say we can replace eggs by, for example, applesauce. So here we can also use, for example, instead of water or plant-based milks, in this case, I used apricot or pear puree. So I'm, the only thing what I still want to show you is I'm going to slice one of the cakes I already baked in advance for you, um, just to see the texture that we can really get very, very tasty um, cakes, plant-based or non-plant-based for me should be the same flavor. With this cake, I've been baking it a lot over the lockdown and been sending it out to all the neighbors and they did not taste the difference or did not realize it was plant-based. And that for me, if you want to go uh, to make plant-based pastries, it has to taste the same or as close as possible as normal pastry. So I'm just going to get my knife and then I, let's also maybe still answer some questions. Um, which, uh, which vegan butters do you recommend for use? There we go. Okay. Um, vegan butters that we recommend for use, like I'm, to be honest, I'm not too familiar at this point, what is, for example, available in the US. Um, for now, if I, all of it, what I, um, what I use are the vegan butters I'm currently making myself and the ones we were just talking about. There are some that uh, I like that I can find here in the vegan store next door that are based on coconut. So I think with the vegan butters, for now, the best to do is to taste yourself what is in the market around you, um, which you like and which work for you. Um, and stay tuned for our new recipe. Okay, we saw the cake, we heard, we heard about it all. I've noticed that Raul has done a very good job of showing you questions as we go through, because there are questions that I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you, and then you're basically asking them ju just as they show up in, in the Q&A. Um, so yeah. I would say there, there are many more questions in the Q&A, but I think in the interest of time, and since we have been answering questions throughout, um, Patricia has been pasting into the chat uh, Marika's Instagram contact. Uh, there are links to all of her recipes. If you act quickly, you can copy paste and we hope you try them out. And I think with that, let's, let's end here and let's thank our speaker so much. Thank you, Marika. This was fabulous. Um, 
I think I think it's amazing to watch how all of these different textures um, change and and how you think about them as a chef. I th I, th I think it was fabulous. Thank you so much. And we'll give you a hand from the homes. Thank you.